Hi, it is Sunday morning, January 15th, and uh, we have with us Matt Crawford, uh, who is uh, is the technical title sound engineer. Is that the right one? Sure, sure. Okay. It's one of my many hats, yeah. And then also a drummer and musician. Uh-huh. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for joining us. We thanks met on a uh, we met on a project. Uh, I don't know if we can actually talk about it yet. Um, I don't know. I don't even know if they're still working on it. I haven't been out there in a while, so. Okay. We did some pickups, and then who knows what happens at this point. Right. Um, but uh, Matt was there working, and we chatted a bit, and uh, here we are. Yeah. So let me just start by uh, getting to know you a little bit. Um, start from the basics. Where are you from? Where'd you grow up? All these kinds of things. Sure. Uh, originally, I grew up in uh, a little town just south of Houston, Texas, uh, called Friendswood. Oh, uh, cool name. A, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a neat little town. I went back there um, over the Christmas break to visit, and it's a completely different place. It's amazing how how much it's grown there. Uh, really? How has it uh, How has it changed? Ah, uh, there's just where there used to be just fields. There's just rows and rows and rows of subdivisions and houses and wow new okay. shops and yeah it's just it's gotten and really big what was it like growing up there uh pretty quiet actually really? yeah okay. there wasn't you know it was just a a typical life it's very hot there uh-huh uh, you know we we deal with storms and all of that every year uh um, like like now right so uh, yeah yeah so um where did you go after that uh well I I grew up there um and then I went to a, a small uh college called in Texas City which is called College of the Mainland it's just a junior college uh huh and that's where I started my my music degree that's where I started studying uh started with this guy named Bob Adams who's just a a fantastic drummer um, okay. So I stalked you a bit and looked at your website. So uh, you were always into music since you were a child. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I started listening to records as as long as as I can remember, and uh, started playing a little bit of piano when I was around nine or ten, and then uh, got into the drums when I was eleven. Okay. Uh, and so I've been been playing ever since then. So, um, what is it about music, and what is it about drums that particularly appeals to you? Uh you know, I, I've just always enjoyed all kinds of music, mm-hmm. you know, from old rock and roll and jazz to, you know, even some top 40 things today that I enjoyed listening to. Um, and somehow the, you know, when I first started taking piano lessons when I was a kid, I was like, oh, okay, this is fun. But it was kind of work, you know, it hmm. was like, you know, do I have to practice? Yeah, you have to practice. Um, and then when I decided I wanted to play drums and I got my first drum kit, it was probably one of the most natural things I fell into. I just kind of sat down That's and great. Could, yeah. could do it. You know, it made uh-huh. sense to me. And uh, That's great. Yeah, and I've been doing it ever since. You know? Some people just have affinity for certain things. I've learned that, so. Seems that way, yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, if I try to pick up a guitar or anything, I can play a little, but not like all my guitar buddies that I gig with. You know, <laughs> they're just. I was always fascinated by that because, <clears> you know, uh, I, I I played a viola as a kid and, uh-huh. It was a bit of work and all this kind of stuff. And then, uh, sure. you know, so, I mean, uh, it was fun. It was great, but it was a bit of work and, you know, everybody has a certain propensity for things. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you uh, went to college for music and then uh, did you go into sound after that? Yeah. Um, I I ended up studying music uh, through the, the mid to late nineties. I ended up going to North Texas, which is up just North of Dallas. Um, and, you know, have played music ever since and ended up moving to, after I was on quite a few tours, I moved to New York in 2003, um, uh, where I continued and, and to was play. New York the, uh, like the place to, to actually, you know, move further in your career or in yeah, what you're exploring at, at the time, you know, cause I was playing a lot of musical theater and I thought, oh, this okay. would be a great place to do that. And, uh-huh. you know, being a jazz player as well, I thought there's a great place to do that. And I, you know, for 20 years there, I managed to pretty much make a living only playing drums. Um, mm, okay. Until, uh, I guess it was around 2007. Yeah. I went to audio school. Uh, it was just uh, like a 13 month program, basically, mm-hmm. is all it was um, at the Institute of Audio Research. Okay. Because I had always enjoyed audio. I'd always just kind of messed around with it, but 
I didn't really know what I was doing. You know, it was mm-hmm. just something fun to try. I was like, I can well, understand that. So why do all my recordings sound so terrible and everybody else <laughs> sounds so great? I don't know. So I thought, you know, I it's been always kind of a hobby for me, but I also kind of wanted some extra work to fall back on or just have mm-hmm. extra work to do. So I went to audio school and that's where I kind of got the basics. I was like, oh, this is why my recordings are sounding so bad. Now I get it. <laughs> Actually, I know you can't summarize everything in like, you know, a year or two years of school in, sure. you know, but I always think of it like I'm an actor. So, mm-hmm. and I've done some video production and things like that, but audio was always that mystery to me because, um, you know, it was one of those things I, I, it wasn't the thing I spent the most time on. Right. And I was always like, Hmm, how do you make this sound better? So to answer your question, uh, why does my stuff sound so crappy, if you will? <laughs> well, I haven't heard any of your stuff, so I, I, I doubt it does. Um, yeah, well, one example, I can remember being in class one day with, with one of my teachers, and he said, today we're going to talk about phase cancellation, mm-hmm. which is, you know, basically when you have two sound waves from the same source, and they're, mm-hmm. you know, one is going one way, but the other one is going the other way and they're just kind of stacked on top of each other out of phase basically Uh so they will cancel each other out and if they're if it's not the exact same sound source but the same uh uh content basically it will it may just phase out certain frequencies so that will knock out certain sounds in your recording is that what it is kind of um uh you know, one test you can do if you have two of, of the exact same sound and they're mono mm-hmm. and you bring them up, say, on two tracks on a board, mm-hmm. you throw one of those out of phase. Okay. And the sound will completely disappear. Okay. Can, I'm not turn, sure I turn, understand that, but uh, you could turn if you had one on one track and you had one on the other, and one track was turned down and one was turned up. If you bring the other one up to match the volume of the other track, if it's out of phase, they will completely cancel each other out and you will hear nothing. So when you say, okay, so when you say out of phase, does it mean that the timing is off a little bit? The the actual sound waves are completely out of phase by 180 degrees. So if you had had like a single sine wave, which is, Mm -hmm. you know, basically this kind of shape. Mm Mm-hmm. If you had the same sine wave played out of phase where, where one is, is the wave is going down, but the other one's going up and they're completely out of phase with each other, they completely cancel each other's sound out. Okay. So, so theoretically, I think I understand that, but I guess um, practically what kind of situation would that be? And like, if I'm recording something, how would that help me improve recording? Sure. Well, so like my professor was showing, was talking about it that day and he took two microphones and spoke into them Mm -hmm. and kept the, the diaphragms of the microphones right next to each other. So the sound wave from his voice was hitting the microphones at the same time. Uh So they were in, they were in phase. Right. Okay. So he slowly started moving the microphones away from each other and you could hear this just whirly swishy, kind of sound happening and all uh-huh. the low frequencies of his voice disappeared. And so basically what was happening is the sound waves were out of phase enough that the bass frequencies within those two microphones were canceling each other out. So if you have two microphones on a source and they're out of phase from each other, you will get, you will, you will lose something in, in the different frequency ranges, depending on, where out of phase those microphones are so and, you don't want to do that is what you're saying right or you you have to be careful when you have multiple mics on a source say a drum kit mm-hmm. your overheads depending on where they are let's say in uh position to the snare drum and then you have a microphone on the snare drum as well so there's three microphones happening those overheads can be depending on how, where they are, can be out of phase with that snare drum mic. Oh, okay. And therefore you, all this, the beautiful low end you might hear on a snare drum could be completely canceled out when you bring up the sound of all three microphones. 
Okay, so this yeah. is a mistake that I guess beginners would commonly make. Is 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 that fair? Yeah, and they you know you can get that same face cancellation even between your overheads if they're too close to each other, and they're the diaphragms of the microphones aren't quite even to the sound source of the drum kit. They'll they'll knock each other out, and you will hear this awful swishy, lacking of frequencies and things like that. Interesting. Uh, okay, the drum set seems to be. Of, of all the instruments that we mic up in the studio, it's one of the most difficult because of all those microphones and you run into all these situations and something could sound terrible and you can just move one microphone just a little bit to the left or the right and suddenly, oh, there it is because it's now it's in phase with all the other microphones. Um, another common thing, often they'll mic a snare drum on top and bottom. Mm -hmm. And because those microphones can basically be facing each other, you have the diaphragm of one microphone going in when the sound hits it and the other one going the other direction. So that makes the microphones out of phase. I see. Okay. So you'll hit the phase button on one of those microphones and it will put them back in phase. Mm -hmm. And then all of that deep tone and sound that you want will return when you bring up both microphones. It's, wow. it's, okay. it's a weird phenomenon and something I didn't know anything about, you know, until I went to wow. audio school and they explained it to me and they played it for me. I was like, that's that terrible sound on all my drum recordings. Now I get it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, know, I, you know, I'm sure like I, I never heard of it, but then again, I never really explored sound enough. How about this? Let's, yeah. uh, let's see what we could, um, for the person out there who's, let's say, Average, uh, average content creator or, you know, a budding filmmaker in LA, which there are many, uh, yeah. you know, and w any advice for them about sound or a, a few basic things they could learn that might help them. Um, so either, you know, well, field uh, you sound know, or, or recording, like either recording film content, you know, whatever, you know, somebody might be doing on their own and I'm sure they have no time to learn sound. Sure. Well, you know, a, a lot of it is your environment. Okay. Um, you know, that's why, that's why we record things like, like when you were at keywords, we do that in a studio environment because it's mm -hmm. controlled. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, like you see here, you know, I don't know if you're, you're picking up any of the car noise going by on the street. You know, this isn't, my apartment isn't the ultimate environment for recording. You know, I think so you I do have, I see some sound panels though, right? Is that right? There are, are the sound panels? panels and I, yeah, and I, I do do some recording in here, um, uh -huh. but it's limited depending on how much noise is going on outside, et cetera. But the, the reason why those sand pa sound panels are up is because there's a lot of reflections in a room. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, especially this room, it's a square room. And so you have frequencies just bouncing off of each other. And it those are things to listen for, you know, if you're, so let's say you're you're not in a studio environment. Um, right. If you're in a field environment, a lot of sound engineers will put up all of these baffles around where they're recording to make a tighter, less reflective environment you know, mm -hmm. for getting better recordings. And that's, it comes down to using your ears. If I go into a, a, a new venue where say I'm mixing a band or, or a, uh, anything for a live event first thing i have to do is listen to that room when i walk in mm -hmm. because and especially in those environments you're mixing the room so depending on what the room is giving me the room can have a lot of low end build up mm -hmm. so i want to make sure i don't add more low end to my recording because the room's already providing that for me okay um and it's kind of this you know out on the field <clears throat> if you're doing a uh, recording for a film or something like that but those guys are listening all the time you know they they're you have to listen like a microphone and mm -hmm. that's not what our that's not what our minds are made to do our minds are made to tune things out so that we can concentrate on you know say you and me are having a conversation my mm -hmm. mind is focused on on listening to you right right and so uh, my mind isn't necessarily hearing the traffic going by outside. Right. Uh -huh. Or say if I had an air conditioner on or some other sound happening, but microphones don't care. Right, right. <laughs> they hear 
everything. And that's, that's the hardest thing is to go into a situation and listen like a microphone and think, oh, we've got to make sure that air conditioner gets turned off. And, oh, we got to make sure we have a baffle over here or et cetera, et cetera. So is there, um, I mean, if you do that, which is hard, but um, I mean, what you get, what's there is what, it, the thing that I found about sound is, I mean, what, what you have in the room is what you get. And, and is there much you can do about it afterwards? Like, um, there I mean, are you some probably, things you can yeah. do. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's different filters and different EQs and, and things that you can, um, run things through, you know, like, for example, after this, you could put a, a different EQ on my voice or okay. you could put it, make it sound like my microphone is in a different environment from where I am. There's tricks you can do, but the goal is get the best possible sound you can going in because mm -hmm. you, you may not necessarily be able to fix it later. All right. So what are the, some things, of the basic things you do after you record? Let's say you get what you get, right? Um, and you sure. do what you can to feel like, what are some of the just, and conceptually, because I mean, probably most people don't know, you know, the details of what all these things mean, but <laughs> um, what are some things that you can do with sound after it's been recorded? Well, for example, um, I, I've mixed a lot of independent films. And so mm -hmm. I will get what they call our stems mm -hmm. from, from the director, from the people that recorded the sounds. And there'll be a score stem, which has the music on it. And there'll be a one that has dialogue on it. And there'll be one that has sound effects on it in mm -hmm. general. And okay. so you go through and you mix everything to make it sound balanced for the film. Mm -hmm. And quite often, especially from independent filmmakers who are still learning, off of the audio is the worst part. And off mm -hmm. of the audio that comes in from, say, the dialogue stem, because they don't necessarily have money, say, to go to a studio like like keywords or anything like that to re-record the dialogue. So it's whatever they captured during right, the filming. Right. Uh -huh. And there'll be so much background noise and things going on. Again, it comes back to listen like a microphone and make sure things are quiet. But uh -huh. I've I've gotten things where uh, you know, there'll be a, a quiet conversation between two characters and then you'll hear a truck go by. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not on film; mm -hmm. it's just noise in there. Right. So I will, I will do like a special EQ at that moment. Let's say it's an automated EQ that it's it's called a, a high pass filter, where it basically takes the low end frequencies out. So if right. it's a really so big run the truck, yeah. so as that truck goes by, I will automate that high pass filter to go with the truck. And then pull that back out so that the low frequencies are back when they continue their conversation, but it will at least lower as much as I can the noise of the truck. Okay. Um, kind of an old way of doing it. There, now things are getting so, you know, technology is moving so fast and so far forward. There are now programs that can just take the noise out of the, of the truck out of that audio. Oh, okay. That's pretty impressive because I know that's um, a hard thing to do. It is, you know, but but uh, the Isotope makes some great um, uh, plugins that do just that for noise removal. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, you know, I don't know if you if you paid any attention to the uh, that Beatles Get Back thing that came um, out. I saw a part year. of it. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, for that film to get that audio to sound so great, they've developed some noise removal technology that's. AI controlled and they can take huh? all the other noises from a single microphone and just the sound that they want. Wow. And okay. Use and, and hear that. Uh, they use that. They just remixed um, the Beatles revolver album and uh -huh. they used the same technique they used in get back mm -hmm. so that this album that was only recorded to four tracks uh -huh. uh, say that, say the drums were all mono one track. Uh -huh. They can now take that, separate each instrument from a single track and make five more instrument tracks out of it. Ah, uh, interesting. Okay. I, it's it's really high tech. It's just like the new thing that's going on. Wow, okay. So when that gets, if that ever gets in the hands of everyday audio engineers, mm -hmm. if somebody sends you a bad dialogue take, you know, 
it be nothing to being able to to separate all of the all of the noise and interesting interesting okay yeah cool yeah um so let me ask uh, uh, uh is is drums and performing uh your first love right would you say yeah absolutely okay. sure sure and uh i think you only moved to la recently was I it like in we, may in yep. may okay so yeah. it's been less may than a year um yeah. So tell us a little bit about like how you decided to come here and how how the transition has been and so forth. Sure. Um, you know, I, I lived in New York for 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. I still go back uh, just about once a month still to to play with a band back there that I you know enjoy playing with. Um, but I had pretty much burned myself out. I was working okay. about seven days a week. Uh -huh. um, I was and driving in, a thousand in, in, miles a week. Is that uh between music and jobs or is that other jobs? Yeah, I would I would do music on the weekends. Uh -huh. uh, played with a pretty big company there that kept me really busy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and I also did audio on the side. Okay. Um, and I also worked at Princeton University where I did audio there. Okay. So I lived in Greenwood Lake, New York, which is about 50 miles northwest of the city. Okay. So it was... Uh, 75 mile drive to Princeton one way wow. every day. Yeah, that's a commute. Yeah. Yeah. I know. So I, was, I sort of know the area a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So I was doing that plus, you know, gigging in the city or, or Long Island or Connecticut or New Jersey mm -hmm. every weekend. I had been doing that for almost 18 years and was just kind of worn out. I was like, I you know, I, I, these are still things I love to do, but I'm just, I'm tired of the weather i got you know i grew up yeah. in texas so uh, <laughs> shoveling snow is not a happy event for me <laughs> understand understand yeah and i was tired of the cold and, and all that mess <clears> it felt <throat> like the east coast yesterday i have to say it was the first time in a long time in la where i was like this is like i grew up on the east coast I'm like this is like where oh, i grew yeah. up you know like it was I cold know, was like, and this... rainy and it was like and i always say it's worse in la because the construction is so bad; it's probably the same temperature outside as it is inside. Oh, absolutely! Because in the East Coast, at least the buildings are like brick, and you're like, I yeah. can run to the, my building and be warm, but yeah. not here. <laughs> no, it's it's different. It really is. Yeah. Uh, but you know, the nice thing is, you know, of course it's winter here, so yes, we're getting the rain. Mm -hmm. But I haven't shoveled any snow this year. <laughs> there you go. And uh, so, are are you good. liking it? Is it uh, is LA treating you well? Or are you finding it like what you uh, want it to be? I really love it here. This is uh -huh. you know, I enjoy living here. Um, it's it's still a struggle finding work. That's that's kind of my where I am right now. I'm doing everything I can to find more gigs. Um, right, right. Um, it's kind of funny. I, I I grew up in Texas. Uh huh. And I moved to New York, and I lived in New York for twenty years. Uh huh. And I moved to L.A. Mm -hmm. And one of the first calls I get is from this guy in a country band asking me if I would play drums for their band. <laughs> Like I had to go through all of that from Texas to play in a country band. Okay. <laughs> That's funny. So I've yeah, done a couple of gigs with those guys. But. Well, and I think of LA as like a, a more urban rap town as opposed to, you know, country and other things, but I'm sure yeah. there are like pockets of everything everywhere. Apparently there are, I, you know, I was really surprised when I got the call, you know, this guy yeah. just called me out of the clear blue and he says, do you play country? And I'm like, are you paying me? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's my answer. It's like, can you be a Frenchman? Yeah. Maybe, yes. <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> so let me ask you this. Are you working more on the music side of it or you do you want to do more on the sound engineering, uh, sound technician side or what's your um, emphasis, if you will? And, uh, you know, where, where would you like to head, if you will? At, yeah, that's a good question. I, I ask myself this every day. What I get up every day and go, what's, what's today going to be like? What am I going to do today? Sure. Um, I understand. Uh, I'll always play drums and that's what I love to do. Mm -hmm. And every chance I get, I try to go do that. Uh, but I love audio engineering as well. Okay. Um, I really enjoy the studio side of it. Okay. Uh, because I was doing live sound at Princeton mm -hmm. and got kind of tired of that. It's a different, it's almost like playing an instrument live, you know, what yeah. happens happens. And if there's a, mistake you know everybody knows about it and it's it's pretty pretty stressful environment i can um, understand because uh, uh i did some filmmaking and then when you shoot a live event i'm always stressed because 
you know, if something goes wrong, it's not like you can do anything about it. And then Nothing the thing is do. over, right? It's like, yeah. whatever you're supposed to capture, like happened. And like, either you missed it and it screwed up or, you know, and like, there's no going back and trying to like, there's no second take. Sure. And yeah. And the, the nice thing about that though, also is, is people are, uh, people have a short term memory for things. Yeah. Like they, yeah. All, they always say when we play something, as long as the beginning of the song is great, and as long as the ending of the song is great, whatever happens in the middle, people forget about. That's, you know, that's so, true. Yeah. So if it's a little mistake live, no big deal. Um, so I, the, the only bit of live engineering I'm doing right now is I, I, I've got a few jobs down at the Beverly Hilton hotel mm -hmm. where I've done some live engineering for them. So they call me freelance every once in a while to do something. Uh -huh. uh, and then of course, working at keywords, you know, occasionally I get to, they'll, they'll call me uh, maybe once or twice a month to okay. do something there. Um, so, so it's, it's a matter of just looking for more work is what I'm doing now. And I would like it to be on the studio side of things, but who knows? So this is similar. I mean, every like every artist, I think, has this problem of how do you move your career or how do you find more work? How do you do the next gig? You know, as yeah. an actor, it's a constant problem, right? Sure. So, I mean, on your side of the business, uh, what are things you can do? Or um, is it just you're kind of just, you know, keep you get up every day and just see what you can do and you maybe randomly meet somebody or whatever and you know it's, it's a little bit of that i mean yeah. there is quite a bit of fate involved you know who uh -huh. who are you going to run into or the fact that we ran into each other and things like that uh you never know on a job who you're going to meet right um but it's it's you know every day i'm sending out resumes and every day i'm i'm like i went and heard uh, uh a guy that i have had met recently in a band play bass last night with another right. band you know, he had invited a bunch of us down to go here and play. I was like, sure. And by doing that, I met four other musicians last night. Right. Who might I, call me one day. And you, you know, you never know. Right. Sorry. I, I do no, I do have a suggestion for you. Mm. Um, and you may know this already, so you can shut me up if you do. Um, so luckily in the last year, dubbing has been a big thing for me. Because mm. there's been all this stuff from Asia and and I guess Netflix is doing a lot more dubbing now. Sure. Uh, with all this content. So there's been, there's been this rise in dubbing and they are willing to, um, uh, they're more willing to, you know, the, uh, work with new people because I think this is relatively new. So for mm -hmm. example, I've noticed that the directors are actually relatively new in, uh, in dubbing. Right. You know, and so um, I've been doing a lot of work for uh, the companies, uh, you know, SDI, which mm -hmm. I don't know if I would suggest sending a resume there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've been recording a lot at VSI, which okay. is another. So, and they they had two facilities, I think, in in um, Northridge, like oh, just for, right. Yeah, I've heard of both of those. So that might be worth looking into because I think that market is, is expanding. Um, and sure. uh, yeah, so I've been running is that I so and I'm sure you know Roundabout, which has like a ton of studios, right? Uh huh. Yeah. So um, I've done a couple gigs over there as well. So I don't know how the hiring system works, but I just know that there's a lot going on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those are places that I send resumes to and, you know, and hopefully I can pick up some work in, in places like that. Okay. A lot of it is who, you know, you know it is because I think, uh, yeah, they have to kind of, you know, LA is such a, you know, meet somebody face to face, kind of like this. It really is. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, so, Hey, maybe somebody will watch this and that might help someday. That would be wonderful. <laughs> 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 but it, it's a pretty saturated market too, which is hard because I, when I send resumes out, like I'll do something like on deed or LinkedIn or something like that. And it'll say, yeah, you're one of 165 applicants. Yeah. And they only need one guy and here, you know, 165 people have already applied for it. It's like, wow. Yeah. And I, I think you, you are right. It's, it's very much, um, you know, if they've met you, it, it gives, it's makes your odds so much better in this town. And let right. me say as an actor, it's completely like that. I think, I mean, yeah. Um, and you know, anything like as a, I'm a photographer too, by the way. Oh, nice. So, Hey, if you ever need a headshot, uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But uh, even like I found like the photography thing on the business side has I found very interesting uh -huh. because a couple of things like um, one thing I used to I do I do social media I post um, but I used to post like I would travel I post fifty pictures at once and I realized nobody ever looks at all of them 
So if you post mm-hmm. one a day, the consistently people just knowing that you're around. Right. So it reminds them. And then one day, like six months later, somebody will call me and say, hey, would you take my pictures? And I was like, oh, I've been looking at your pictures, which I don't really realize because they actually, a lot of people don't have the time to even like the photo, mm-hmm. but they say, I've been looking at your photos. Like I had no idea, right? Um, nice. And the other thing I found is that I could, I get inquiries like from random places like Yelp and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, never get hired. But if they actually know me, if they've seen my photos somewhere, sure. they just call up and say, hey, will mm-hmm. you shoot? And I don't even have to sell it sometimes. Oh, that's great. So, so the, the the degree to which people know you, I think, or are a little, at least a little bit familiar with your work makes such a big difference. Yeah, I agree. And that's that's where I'm the difficult place I'm in right now is I just don't know a lot of people yet. Yeah. And I'm so sure it's, it's just a matter of there. time too, because, you know, it takes a little while to land and get to know the town and get around and then meet more people and all those kinds of things. Yeah. Well, you know, even for you know, the example, the the job that I got at keywords when mm-hmm. I worked there, I, I have been sending resumes to all kinds of places. I might even sent them a resume at one point. Uh, I don't right. remember. And I was just on LinkedIn one day. And there was a a, a random pop-up came from another audio engineer. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, he's in LA. I was like, I'm just going to email this guy. Right. Said, hey, my name is Matt Crawford. I'm an audio engineer. I just moved to LA, blah, blah, blah. And he emails me back immediately. He says, oh, I have some offers at this place called Keywords. He says, I'm always, I says, I just haven't been available to do it. Right. Here's the guy's number. Why don't you call him? Maybe he'll hire you. That's great. And, yeah. And that's what happened. So I, I immediately, instead of just sending a resume, I called the guy at keywords and he says, well, yeah, come on in. Let me meet you. Mm-hmm. Make sure you're not crazy or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you and know, that, it's, 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 it's a tough mm, world out yeah, there. Yeah. It's a tough yeah. world. Um, and yeah, and that was it. And it just happened to be from one random cold call. If you'll have it kind of email that I made. I guess that's but how it starts out, right? You but know? it's that it's making that connection with a person, you know, as you mentioned, rather than just right, uh, right. You know, standing uh, I'll, I'll mention one other thing, uh, and uh, this thing is about to probably cut us off in about five minutes, so we'll wrap up pretty right. soon. Um, but apparently, there and I unfortunately I don't know the exact. I can't refer you exactly, but but there's some production listing somewhere where okay. they uh, in L A where they look for crew and things like that for films. Wow. But that might be an entree into, yeah, you know, absolutely. uh, eventually post production on sound because I'm sure, you know, th- that crowd of people. Um, and I wish I had the, I haven't looked at it in a while, so I don't have the exact reference for you, but maybe mm-hmm. something to check into. That's all. Yeah, I need to look into more things like that because I've done a lot of of post production. Yeah, um, I've done I've done a lot of score mixing, which is mm-hmm. which is great. You yeah, know, where I'm not necessarily mixing the whole film. But you know, also edited and mixed dialogue, and I've created sound effects. And I have two last questions for you. We'll try to make this quick. Sure. Um, so it seems like if you're a mixer, there's it overlaps with what a per sound producer or a pr- you know producer for music might do. Has that ever interested in you, or is it too mo- far of a gap to be uh, be thinking about things in those terms? Um, a sound producer, you mean, is like, say someone, that... a music producer or something like that, you know, there's a whole sales side mm-hmm. to it, which is separate, but in terms of like going into a studio and working with putting together something that sounds seems a little bit similar. Is that it, like it is. so naive um, of me? No, um, you know, a lot of musicians, um, a lot of sound engineers, um, are also producers. Mm-hmm. Um, usually some of the best quality work, there are exceptions. Um, some of the best quality work is when you only wear one of the hats. I I can see that. Yes. Um, so if somebody called me in and said, Hey, would you produce my album? I'd be like, sure, let's go to mm-hmm. a studio and let's get you a good sound engineer. Mm-hmm. And I'll do wear the hat of producer, which is, you know, basically, telling the artist what I hear and how I think what, what we can do to make things better. Right. Things like that, where the sound engineer, then he or she is just concentrating on taking the, the things that I want to happen and making them happen. Right. Right. And to where it's, you know, they're not really putting in their two cents. 
unless mm-hmm. I'm having a problem. They go, you know, I know why we're not, the sound isn't working. Mm-hmm. Let's try this, et cetera. Uh, and then, you know, then you have your musicians and they're busy playing their instrument. And then you have some people that can do it all. I mean, you know, if you, if you ever listen to Prince, if you remember him, right, he would, right. he would do, he would wear all the hats. Yeah. Not, he, not he was really, crazy, yeah, crazy talented. Not, totally. And now he would not always necessarily be the sound engineer for the, the recording. Right. But he was in there doing the mixing and producing and, you know, so right. some people can do it all, but yeah, it's, but it all it's it's all very intertwined. I mean, many musicians yeah. have produced things for other artists, and other artists have been sound engineers for other artists. Mm-hmm. And yeah, okay, uh, gotta gotta know a little bit of all of it, really. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Okay, I think we're almost at time, so I'm going to end it there before like it suddenly cuts us off without like warning. So oh, okay, uh, great. But thank you so much. That's been great. I hope it wasn't too hard for you. Thanks for getting up on a Sunday morning. Oh, sure. You know? I I appreciate you doing this. I, you know, I, I wasn't sure what what questions you were going to ask and what you wanted to know about. So I'm <laughs> a know. difficult interviewer. <laughs> I don't know if my life is is that exciting to hear about. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's always good to know you. And then, uh, you know, I tried to to learn a few things, which I did. So that was great. And right, so there right. you go. All right. So thank you so much. And uh, I'll sign off. And as I mentioned, I'll, you know, I'll, we'll go over this later, but uh, thank you. Sure. Much. Okay. This Have has been great... fun. Thanks so much, Ming. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.